Hi there, law students. Welcome to another episode of Law Lectures. This time, ang pag-uusapan natin ay who may be parties to civil actions. There are several special rules on this topic and these are found in sections 1 to 22 of Rule 4 of the Rules of Court. The parties in an ordinary civil action are called plaintiff and defendant. The plaintiff is the claiming party while the defendant is the party who is opposing the plaintiff's claim. Remember the designations of parties in ordinary civil actions. They are plaintiff and defendant, not petitioner and respondent, which refers to the parties to special proceedings. Magkaiba yon. And for now, because you are law students, we have to be very technical about these terms dahil may mga kasamang ibig sabihin o kahulugan ang bawat technical term na to. Again, the parties in ordinary civil actions are plaintiff and defendant. There are three kinds of parties to civil actions. One is natural persons. Number two, we have juridical persons. And number three, entities authorized by law. A natural person is an individual human being. A juridical person is a fictional person created by law. Under Article 44 of the New Civil Code, merong tatlong klaseng juridical persons. Number one, the state and its political subdivisions, katulad na lang ng local governments. We have the provinces, we have the cities, and we have the municipalities. Number two, we have corporations, institutions and entities for public interest or purpose created by law, katulad ng government-owned or controlled corporations. And number three, we have corporations, partnerships, and associations for private interest or purpose. These are registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Tandaan na ang sole proprietorship is not authorized by law to be a party. What I mean is that it cannot sue or be sued under its business name. The per person to be sue to, to sue or be sued is the individual owner, but you can indicate that he or she is doing business under the name and style of the single proprietorship business and you should indicate the business name. So, let's look at a case decided by the Supreme Court in 2002. It is the case of Anita Mangila versus Court of Appeals, GR number 125027. By the way, mababasa nyo ang tungkol sa topic na to at ang case na to sa aking virtual textbook on civil procedure which you can access at www.profchato.com. Again, www.profchato.com. So, yung case ng Anita Mangila versus Court of Appeals involved two individuals, Anita Mangila, who resided in Pampanga, and Loretta Gina, who resided in Paranaque. Alright? So, again, importante kasi pinag-uusapan natin dito yung venue. Anita Mangila resided in Pampanga, and Loretta Gina resided in Paranaque. Mangila is a seafood exporter doing business under the name and style Seafood Products. This is a sole proprietorship business. Gina has a freight forwarding business under the name and style of Air Swift International. Mangila engaged the services of Gina to transport seafood products from the Philippines to Guam. The items were shipped but Mangila did not pay on time despite demand. Gina filed a complaint for sum of money against Mangila in the RTC of Pasay City. She filed it in Pasay because that was the location of her sole proprietorship business, Air Swift International. There were a number of issues raised in this case and one of them is improper venue. So the issue was, is it proper for the plaintiff to file the case in Pasay um, despite the fact that the plaintiff's residence was in Paranaque and the defendant's residence was in Pampanga, whereas the plaintiff's business was located in Pasay. Sabi ng Supreme Court, venue was improper. The case uh, should have been filed either in Paranaque or in Pampanga, the residence of the plaintiff or the residence of the defendant, respectively. It should not have been filed in Pasay where the sole proprietorship business is located. 
it would have been different if the business is a corporation which has a separate legal personality. On the other hand, in a sole proprietorship, the legal personality belongs to the owner who is a natural person. Now, there is another case, Berman Memorial Park Incorporated versus Cheng, decided in 2005. You can also find this case in my virtual textbook on civil procedure. In this case, Iloilo Memorial Park was implemented as a defendant. In the course of the proceedings, it was revealed that Iloilo Memorial Park is not a corporation. It is just a business name used by its owner for the Memorial Park. The owner of Iloilo Memorial Park was Berman Memorial Park Incorporated, which is registered as a corporation. The Supreme Court ordered that Berman Memorial Park Incorporated should be implemented as a party instead of Iloilo Memorial Park. Now, let's talk about real parties in interest. It is important that a person who is implemented as a party to a civil action is a real party in interest. Section 2 of Rule 4 defines real party in interest as follows. The interest of a party either as a plaintiff or defendant, should be real and substantial. It should be an existing interest, one that is in esse and not a future or inchoate one. When we say in esse, it's, uh, it's a Latin term for existing. It's already existing at present. So the right must be existing and not a future one. To determine who the real party in interest is, let us go back to the elements of a cause of action. First, we have the plaintiff's right. Second, we have the defendant's obligation to respect that right. And third, there is a violation by the defendant that causes damage or injury to the plaintiff. So who can be parties? A person can be a plaintiff if he is the owner of the right that is violated. Or a person can be a defendant if he was the one who committed the violation. Suppose there was a vehicular collision in which the driver of a car was injured but a passerby was not. In an action for damages due to the physical injury, the driver is a real party in interest and he can bring the action as a plaintiff. The passerby cannot bring the action as a party defendant because he did not incur any injury and there was no right belonging to the passerby that was violated by the defendant. Now, Section 2 also states that the action must be brought in the name of the real party in interest. The name of the real party in interest must be stated in the title of the complaint, either as plaintiff or as defendant. Even if he is a minor or an incompetent person who is under guardianship, the name of the minor or incompetent person must be stated in the title of the complaint together with the name of his guardian. That's found in Section 5. For minors, include the name of the father, mother, guardian, or guardian ad litem. If the person named as plaintiff or defendant is not the real party in interest, the defendant can raise the affirmative defense that the complaint states no cause of action. I said earlier that the interest of a person should be in esse or already existing. So I would like to give an illustration for this. Suppose Pedro is a widower. He has one son named George. Okay, a Pedro sold his land to Maria, but Pedro's son George now brings an action to nullify the sale, claiming that he is interested in the land because he is a future heir of Pedro. He is claiming that he should not be deprived of his share. Since Pedro is still alive, the son George has no right over his father's property and cannot bring an action to nullify the sale. Okay? Spouses as parties. When the case is against a husband and wife, they must be sued jointly as a general rule. This is because of the presumption that their property belongs to their absolute community under the family code. However, there are instances when they may not be sued jointly. When is that? Suppose the husband owns a piece of property that he inherited from his parents during his marriage. Now, this is his exclusive property. If that property becomes the subject of a court case, 
only the husband has to be included as a party defendant. Now, let's talk about indispensable parties. Rule 4, Section 7 requires that all indispensable parties should be joined either as plaintiffs or defendants. It defines indispensable parties as those without whom no final determination can be had of an action. I have another case here, Maria Elena R. de Vinigracia v. Coronacion Parilla, a 2015 case, where the Supreme Court stated, An indispensable party is one whose interest will be affected by the court's action in the litigation, and without whom no final determination of the case can be had. The party's interest in the subject matter of the suit and in the relief sought is so inextricably intertwined with the other parties that his legal presence as a party to the proceeding is an absolute necessity. In his absence, there cannot be a resolution of the dispute of the parties before the court which is effective, complete, or equitable. Thus, the absence of an indispensable party renders all subsequent actions of the court null and void for want of authority to act not only as to the absent parties but even as to those who are present. Now, I would like to give an example again. Let us suppose that Juan, Pedro, and Maria are siblings. They are co-owners of a parcel of land. Juan wants to have the land partitioned. Pedro and Maria are not willing to have the property partitioned. Juan now brings an action for partition but implies Pedro only. Can the case proceed? The answer is no. Maria is an indispensable party because the partition case cannot be completely decided without her participation. She has to be implied in the case as a defendant. Under the rules on partition, if a co-owner refuses to join as plaintiff, he or she should be joined as defendant. Let's now talk about compulsory joinder of indispensable parties. According to the rules, indispensable parties should be joined either as plaintiffs or defendants. Otherwise, the case cannot proceed because it will not result in a full resolution. The court will not dismiss a case when an indispensable party is not joined. Instead, it will issue an order to implead the indispensable party in the case. According to Section 11, non-joinder of parties is not a ground to dismiss a case. We have another category of parties and that is necessary parties. A necessary party is one who is not indispensable but who should be joined so that complete relief can be had. You find this in Section 8. In other words, the case can proceed even without that party and can be partially resolved. However, there can only be a complete resolution if the necessary party is joined. A simple illustration is in order so that you will understand this. Let's think of a joint obligation for a sum of money. Debtor 1 and Debtor 2 borrow 100,000 pesos from the creditor under a single prom promissory note. It was agreed that debtor 1 and debtor 2 will each be liable for 50,000 pesos or a total of 100,000 pesos. After the lapse of the deadline and despite repeated demands, both debtors did not pay. The creditor sued both debtors for 100,000 pesos under the promissory note so that he can recover the full amount. But suppose the creditor cannot do that because he cannot locate debtor 1. He can sue debtor 2, but only for 50,000 pesos. The case can proceed against debtor 2 and be resolved against him only to the extent of 50,000 pesos. Note that under Section 9, the creditor should explain why he cannot implead debtor 1 in this case. Uh, Section 9 states, Whenever in any pleading in which a claim is asserted, a necessary party is not joined, the pleader shall set forth his name if known and state why he is omitted. Should the court find the reason for the omission unmeritorious, 
it may order the inclusion of the omitted necessary party if jurisdiction over his person may be obtained. The failure to comply with the order for his inclusion without justifiable cause shall be deemed a waiver of the claim against such party. The non-inclusion of a necessary party does not prevent the court from proceeding in the action, and the judgment rendered therein shall be without prejudice to the rights of such necessary party. There is another kind of party, and that is the unwilling co-plaintiff. If the consent of any party who should be joined as plaintiff cannot be obtained, he may be joined as defendant, and the reason shall be stated in the complaint. Another rule concerning parties, which I mentioned earlier already, is neither misjoinder nor non-joinder of parties is a ground for dismissal of an action. Parties may be dropped or added by order of the court on motion of any party or on the court's own initiative at any stage of the action and on such terms as are just. Any claim against a misjoined party may be severed and proceeded with independently. Now, we also have what we call a class suit. When the subject matter of the controversy is one of common or general interest to many persons, and this, the persons are so numerous that it is impracticable to join all of them as parties, a number of them which the court finds to be sufficiently numerous and representative, as to fully protect the interests of all concerned, may sue or defend for the benefit of all. Any party in interest shall have the right to intervene to protect his individual interest. There are three requisites for a class suit. Number one, the subject matter is of common or general interest to all. Number two, persons are too numerous to bring them all before the court. And number three, the suit is brought on their behalf by persons who are sufficiently numerous and representative. So, I have an example. This refers to the imposition of toll fees along the expressway. Thousands of people use the expressway every day and there is an impending toll fee increase. Users of the toll road would like to stop the fee increase. This can be the subject of a class suit because it satisfies the three requirements for a class suit. Now, here's an example of a case that is not a class suit. We have a vessel with 300 passengers. The vessel sank. All passengers died. Relatives sued the shipping company for damages for their respective losses. This is not proper for a class suit because the elements, the three elements for a class suit will not be present. How about alternative parties? According to the rules of court, where the plaintiff is uncertain against who of several persons he is entitled to relief, he may join any or all of them as defendants in the alternative, although a right to relief against one may be inconsistent with a right to relief against the other. Example, we have a shipper of goods from China to Manila. The shipper, meaning the sender, engaged the services of a shipping company in China and a warehouse in Manila for storage. When the consignee, meaning the recipient of the goods, received the goods in Manila, 50% was damaged. So the consignee wants to sue for damages but is not sure where the damage occurred. Did it take place during the shipping from China to Manila? Or did the damage take place when the items were already in the warehouse in Manila? The consignee can sue both the shipping company and the warehouse company as alternative parties. Next, we have the concept of an unknown identity or name of the defendant. Whenever the identity or name of a defendant is unknown, he may be sued as the unknown owner, heir, devisee, or by such other designation as the case may require. When his identity or true name is discovered, the pleading must be amended accordingly. And then, 
Section 15 of the rules deals with an entity without juridical personality as defendant. When two or more persons, not organized as an entity with juridical personality, enter into a transaction, they may be sued under the name by which they are generally or commonly known. In the answer of such defendant, the name and addresses of the persons composing said entity must all be revealed. So note, because they are not registered with the SEC or other, other uh, government agency, they cannot sue, but they can be sued. By way of an example, Juan, Maria, and Pedro, they hold themselves out as doing business under the name of JMP Company, but did not register with the Securities and Exchange Commission. They caused damage to a client named George. George can sue them under the name JMP Company. In their answer, they should state their respective names and addresses. Section 16 deals with the death of party and the duty of counsel. Whenever a party to a pending action dies and the claim is not extinguished, it shall be the duty of his counsel to inform the court within 30 days after such death of the fact thereof. And counsel shall give the name and address of his legal representative or representatives. Failure of the counsel to comply with this duty shall be a ground for a disciplinary action. So, it says here, whenever a party to a pending action dies and the claim is not thereby extinguished. So, what cases are extinguished with the death of a party? Cases that are personal to the party like legal separation, uh, declaration of nullity of marriage, or annulment of marriage. Those types of proceedings or actions are extinguished by the death of a party. But if it is a sum of money action, for example, that is not extinguished by the death of a party. And so this provision will have to apply. Continuing further under Section 16, it provides, The heirs of the deceased may be allowed to be substituted for the deceased without requiring the appointment of an executor or administrator and the court may appoint a guardian ad litem for the minor heirs. The court shall order the said legal representative or representatives to appear and be substituted within a period of 30 days from notice. If no legal representative is named by counsel for the deceased party, or if one so named shall fail to appear within the specified period, the court uh, may order the opposing party within a specified time to procure the appointment of an executor or administrator for the estate of the deceased, and the latter shall immediately appear for or on behalf of the deceased. The court charges in procuring such appointment if defrayed by the opposing party may be recovered as costs. Section 17 talks about the death of a, or separation of a party who is a public officer. When a public officer is a party in an action in his official capacity and during its pendency dies, resigns, or otherwise ceases to hold office, the action may be continued and maintained by or against his successor if within 30 days after successor, the successor takes office or such time as may be granted by the court, it is satisfactorily shown to the court by any party that there is a substantial need for continuing or maintaining it and that the successor adopts or continues or threatens to adopt or continue to adopt the action taken by his predecessor. Before substitution is made, the party or officer to be affected, unless expressly assenting thereto, shall be given reasonable notice of the application and accorded an opportunity to be heard. Now, what about if a party is incompetent or incapacitated? If a party becomes incompetent or incapacitated, the court, upon motion with notice, may allow the action to be continued by or against the incompetent or incapacitated person assisted by his legal guardian or guardian ad litem. Now, this provision refers to when a party was capacitated or competent in the beginning, but he becomes incompetent 
or incapacitated in the course of the proceedings. The case can proceed against the party assisted by the legal guardian or guardian ad litem. Section 19, Transfer of Interest. In case of any transfer of interest, the action may be continued by or against the original party unless the court upon motion directs the person to whom the interest is transferred to be substituted in the action or joined with the original party. Section 20, Action and Contractual Money Claims. When the action is for recovery of money arising from contract, express or implied, and the defendant dies before the entry of final judgment in the court in which the action was pending at the time of death, the case shall not be dismissed. Okay? The claim shall not be dismissed, rather, but shall be allowed to continue until entry of final judgment. A favorable judgment obtained by the plaintiff shall be enforced in the manner provided by these rules for prosecuting claims against the estate of a deceased person. Section 21 deals with an indigent party. A party may be authorized to litigate his action, claim, or defense as an indigent if the court, upon an ex parte application and hearing, is satisfied that the party is one who has no money, no property sufficient, and available for food, shelter, and basic necessities for himself and his family. And the effect of the authority given by the court to litigate as an indigent litigant will include an exemption from payment of docket and other lawful fees and exemption from payment of transcripts of stenographic notes, which the court will require the stenographer to furnish to the indigent party. But the amount of docket and other lawful fees which the indigent uh, was exempted from paying shall be a lien on any judgment rendered in the case favorable to the indigent unless the court provides otherwise. Now, under Section 22, on notice to the Solicitor General, in any action involving the validity of any treaty, law, ordinance, executive order, presidential decree, rules or regulations, the court in its discretion may require the appearance of the Solicitor General who may be heard in person or by representative duly designated by him. Now, uh, we also have the concept of representatives as parties. They are representatives, meaning they are acting on behalf of another person. And their authority to act shall be evidenced by a special power of attorney or a trust agreement. He or she is acting on behalf of a principal under an SPA, special power of attorney, or on behalf of a beneficiary under a trust agreement. The name of the principal or beneficiary should be included in the title of the case along with the name of the representative. You find that in section 3. Now, I would also like to discuss this concept of permissive joinder of parties. It is possible to join two or more persons as plaintiffs or defendants as long as certain requisites are present. Rule 6 requires that there should be a question of law or fact that is common to all such plaintiffs or to all such defendants. As an example, suppose there is a vehicular collision between a car and a passenger jeepney. Two passengers in the jeepney were injured as a result the jeepney was also damaged. Now, these two passengers, as well as the owner of the damaged jeepney, can bring separate actions for damages against the driver of the car. However, since the damages arose, arose out of the same vehicular collision, both passengers, along with the owner of the jeepney, can bring one case against the driver of the car. And this will be permissive joinder of plaintiffs in that case. So, until here for now, and I will be seeing you at the next video.
Subscribe to this channel and feel free to tell your classmates and friends about this. If you want to read my virtual textbook on civil procedure, visit www.profchato.com.